Coming up. SpaceX has a launch failure. New Horizons ekes closer to Pluto. And happy, happy joy, joy. Plus, we have an interview with the co-founders of Space VR. Stay tuned. Tomorrow begins right now. And welcome to Tomorrow, episode 8.20 for Saturday, July 4th, 2015. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. With me as always, the beautiful, lovely, wonderful, and talented uh, Vor, is it? Var? Vor? <clears throat> Carrie Ann Higginbotham. We'll have to explain that because no inside jokes are allowed. And uh, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Uh, before we get started, a huge shout out to all of our patrons of Tomorrow who have helped to make this specific episode of this episode happened. No, this specific segment of this episode happened. This is going to be an interesting show. Uh, these are people who have contributed at least $10 to this specific episode. We are a crowdfunded show and every single dollar helps. So you contribute exactly how much you think the show is worth and these people think the show is worth $10 or more. A huge thank you to everyone inside of that list. For more information, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. And why did I call you, what was it, Vor in the beginning? We went to Starbucks this morning, and instead of my name, the barista wrote my drink on the top of the cup. So you're here and after to be referred to as Vor. There you go. All right, <laughs> let's go ahead and get started with some space news. For that, we're going to head straight over to Space Mike. Space Mike, what happened this last week? Hello, everybody. So... Unfortunately, there was a launch anomaly on Monday when SpaceX tried to launch a Falcon 9 rocket with the seventh commercial resupply services mission to the International Space Station. Here's video of the launch. With this mission, there was a lot of uh, payloads on board. Uh, there was a lot of food and supplies, of course, and uh, some science experiments, including student experiments that were actually reflights from that were originally destroyed when the Antares rocket blew up uh, last October, and the cargo on that Cygnus freighter was all destroyed. So that really stinks for some of those students who have uh, those experiments who blew up yet again. And also, one of the other, the, probably the big payload on this was an international docking adapter that is a new adapter that would be placed on top of the old PMA adapters or pressurized mating adapters. Those were the docking ports that were used for the space shuttle to be able to dock to the space station. And those docking ports are not set to the international standard. The whole plan is to have an international standard docking port so that all of the Russian, American, and potentially future space station modules would all have common docking adapters so that potentially any vehicle could go to any of these space stations. So one of those new adapters was destroyed in this launch. And as, as we can see in the video here, um, it's uh, not quite yet, but what has happened, what, what they think has happened is that there was an overpressurization event in the upper stage fuel tank as they were pressurizing it up uh, in preparation for the first stage separation and igniting the second stage engine. Whatever the cause of this overpressurization, which caused the first, the, excuse me, the upper stage tank to uh, essentially explode, is still unknown, or at least hasn't been publicly stated yet. Um, SpaceX is, and uh, some people at NASA are working really hard to find out what the cause of this mission was, and be able to fix that problem on any future launches before the Falcon 9 returns to flight. And that, of course, means that all the future Falcon 9 flights are postponed until the Falcon 9 is certified to return to flight. So, it, it, <laughs> although this is bad news and there might be some critics and detractors, especially in uh, government, who will use this to, for their own purposes, and there's the event right there where the upper stage uh, uh, exploded. Some people think that the Dragon capsule did fall away from, from that. It's not clear. There's that weird shadow that possibly looks like the Dragon capsule, but it's unclear if that actually did separate from it. They did receive signals from the Dragon capsule for uh, anywhere from several seconds to uh, a few minutes after this event. 
Um, and it's uh, NASA, SpaceX has said that they are going to recover some debris. I'm not 100% on what they have recovered, if anything, yet. And although that this mission, you know, although it stinks to have it fail, SpaceX is in a really good position right now. They apparently have plenty of funding. Uh, they have lots of support from NASA, and they will move forward from this. They have had lots of launch failures in the past when they were trying to get Falcon 1 going. They're no stranger to accidents like this, and they will move forward. They will be able to recover from this, get the Falcon 9 flying again, and continue their backlog of, of missions that need to be launched. And I'm really hoping for everybody at SpaceX and uh, send my condolences and all my good vibes to make sure that the, everyone over at SpaceX is inspired and is able to identify the problem, fix it soon, and get back to flying and get back to business. So that's what happened with SpaceX this week. And uh, um, Everything will be okay. I still have a little bit of depression about it, but everything will be okay. <laughs> you know, to make things even worse, it was Elon Musk's birthday that day. So that, uh, not a very good birthday present. All right, thank you, Space Mike. Uh, up next, uh, China has sent up a remote sensing satellite. This one was interesting because it was actually not announced in advance. Uh, so we do have a little bit of footage of this. This happened on June 27th, 2015 at 622 Coordinated Universal Time. Uh, this was a Long March 4B rocket. This is sending up, uh, I believe it's Gaofen 8, which stands for high resolution in English, or at least that is, that is what some of the sources on the interwebs said it stood for. Well, if it's on the interwebs. If it's on the interwebs, then you know it must be true. The interesting thing <laughs> is that China basically had planned for Gaofen 1. Uh, again, if I'm pronouncing that wrong, I'm really sorry. I, we all know that I suck at these pronunciations. Uh, but um, if we go for, they have 1 through 7, and eight was kind of unplanned, so it was unknown yeah. as to yeah where that came from or what that was or why that did that. So uh, the main goal of this series of satellites is to do Earth observation, so it's kind of for disaster relief and things like that. Mm -hmm. Normally we would follow this up with, you know, and clearly this is a military blah, 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 because of its inclination, but this time... We're not actually, sh it doesn't sound that way. So it is probably just another extension of the existing satellite. So there you go. Yay. Mm -hmm. So go China, unannounced launch. <laughs> All right, next up. Uh, a totally announced, totally like fingers crossed sort of situation here. Uh, Russia launched a cargo ship to the International Space Station and did it. Like, it's, it's so Well, silly. it was a big deal because we had three launch failures, not in a row. Everyone's like, in a row. It wasn't in a row. It wasn't in a row. Was Sierra 6 was in between there. Three out of the last seven, which so, is just heartbreaking. There you go. Here's the Russian launch coverage. And I always love how it's like, forever, the engine's firing. You got to make sure it's it's ready to go. You know? You, Dada, we should have audio you don't in this clip. Do you not have audio you're on not going. He's, he says no. Oh, there we go. Of course, now I don't want to hear his audio anymore. Keep going, Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> this is a Progress M28M60P spacecraft from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan at 0455 UTC. Uh, this previous Progress failure due to an issue of the Soyuz U upper stage, but they've implemented some upgrades and moved up the launch that was originally planned uh, for August to this July. This is carrying uh, 1,940 pounds of propellant to the lab, 160 pounds of oxygen, 926 pounds of water, and 3,133 pounds of crew supplies and research equipment. Losing three out of the past seven, of course, cargo missions have cut into the reserve, reducing stockpiles from about six months to four or less. But with this progress, uh, resupply, and the Japanese HTV, H, yeah, HTV cargo ship planned in August, uh, they should be stocked throughout the rest of the year. As somebody else tweeted out a little bit earlier, this week this is probably the most watched progress launch <laughs> and we don't even know how long <laughs> because i i think everyone really just wanted this to go uh it's it's been kind of a, a sad year uh in in terms of crew resupply missions uh but yeah no it went it went great it was beautiful it was a perfectly clear day as you can see so happy happy joy joy all the way around really did you just happy happy joy joy us i did all right moving along <laughs> Uh, we'll throw it back to Space Mike for uh, some more SpaceX news. Space Mike. 
Before I move on to the other SpaceX news, I did want to uh, interject on uh, the Progress launch. Uh, the one that failed actually launched on their new version, the Soyuz 2.1A, uh, and that had a new upper stage that ha had the failure. The version that launched on Friday was the old Soyuz U version, which the Progress has launched on forever, ever since the Molniya rocket, and has been the most reliable of the Soyuz rocket family. So, well, I apologize. My information was wrong, but thank you for the correction. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, no, I just wanted to make sure we 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 got that right. Sorry. No, perfect. <laughs> Anyway, uh, on the SpaceX news, so SpaceX and NASA have uh, unitedly agreed uh, that they're going to push back the date of the next launch abort mission. And with that launch abort mission, they would be launching on a unique version of the Falcon 9 that actually only has three engines, similar to the Falcon 9 Dev 1 vehicle. And this actually, this decision was already being talked about before the CRS-7 launch failure. So uh, this is just something that they have, were already planning on because they wanted to do more preparations and uh, be able to do more work on the Dragon capsule and this special fal Falcon rocket to be able to make sure that they can get as much data as possible from this launch abort mission to make sure that they you know, can pass all the qualifications and requirements that NASA and the FAA and everyone else involved uh, has to allow SpaceX to be certified to start launching crew. And so I think that that's, as much as I hate to have any sort of missions be pushed back even further and be delayed even further, I think it is wise that they want to be able to get as much information as possible and add more sensors, add... There's no, it's not exactly clear exactly what changes they're going to be making to both the Dragon and the Falcon, but from, from what information is available from the uh, press statements that NASA has put out, is essentially that they are just trying to, what I took from it was trying to add more sensors for both the Falcon 9, the special version, and the Dragon capsule to be able to get as much data as possible. So it's unclear when that mission will be pushed, or when that will actually happen. They were in the talks of trying to agree on when might be a good time for that to happen. And even though this unique rocket is not the same as the Falcon 9 rocket, and the issue was with the upper stage anyway, this is just a first stage tank with three engines, that's probably still going to be pushed back until uh, some of these other problems are, are done, or at least get some sort of special certification to launch this unique rocket before the Falcon 9 returns to flight. So. Uh, again, this is just a wise decision to make sure that they can, when they actually do do the test, to get as much data as possible to be able to move forward with the commercial crew program. So that's uh, what's going on with uh, that SpaceX news. And uh, I'm going to pass it back uh, to you guys about uh, some new horizons. Oh, doing his segues. We love Mike and his segues. Uh, so, yeah, some happy, happy, joy, joy news, as Yay. it were. Yeah, absolutely. New Horizons is getting very, very close. Uh, July 14th is its pass-by, like its closest pass-by point. We actually have some, uh, an, a little animation of some higher resolution footage of Pluto. So there you can see uh, Pluto. You know, actually, there are four spots. I don't know that you can see it in this particular uh, animation, but there are four spots on the bottom at its equator. Yeah, Space Mike's saying you can see it a little bit. You can see it on kind of one of the circles. As it's circling around, you can kind of see those four spots kind of show up. We don't know what those are. So we, we're gonna, we gotta go in and they figure out. They could be out. anything. They could be anything. So those are at the equator of Pluto. Um, so July 14th is the flyby. It's gonna be going at more than 30,000 miles per hour or 48,000 kilometers per hour. And the thing is, um, in, in 2011, Hubble found a fourth moon of Pluto. And actually, this is, this is a map of kind of where we're at and where we're today, like right now-ish, around right now-ish, and how much further we need to go on our, and this has been a nine year journey to get there. Uh, and I'm gonna interject really quickly. A uh, huge thank you to uh, NASA for making this a vector graphic that was editable. So we can actually change that. Yes, it was awesome. We could change it to the exact resolution we needed and not lose any fidelity in the image. Nice. Not a lot of places do that. And it was it was a delight to work on for this particular show. So anyhow, uh, so th there you go. That's how far we've gone in the nine years. We've got a, a little bit further to go, 10 more days to go. But in, in 2011, Hubble found uh, which is already in its journey, a fourth moon to Pluto, and now we're like at five, or possibly, well, five moons, and then we're like, is there a sixth moon? Is that what kind of debris is going to be in our way? Uh, so playing it really safe, engineers have developed a, a safe plan uh, just in case to kind of get around any potential man debris mm -hmm. or maneuvers, and they had to execute that a little bit earlier, but uh, they chose not to do that. Um, 
So they're looking good. It looks like they, they were taking imagery of the area using the high resolution cameras and looking for anything else that could be yet another moon. And they're a little disappointed that they didn't find another moon, but a little bit happy that they didn't find one at the same time so they can actually approach it like they want to. Uh, for all the observations to work out, New Horizons, New Horizons is going to have to kind of fly through this very narrow box, which is about 60 by 90 miles. Uh, and it's got about a hundred seconds of ideal time to move through Pluto and then into the Kuiper Belt. So that's uh, that's a very long journey for a very short amount of time. But it's going to be exciting because you know, like I said, ten days away, it's just it's going to be cool. It's going to be awesome. great. First high resolution imagery from Pluto. First mission to Pluto, our planet. I, yay! I'm saying Pluto's a planet. I'm going to say Pluto's a planet. Pluto, our planet. It's. It's going to be cool. So there you go. Uh, next week's show, not next week's show, but the week after that, we should be able to come back with a lot of that data. Yay. Two weeks away. Yay. All right, and finally. So Houston is going to have a spaceport. Isn't that exciting? I, well, they're very excited, I can tell you that much. The Ellington Airport down in Houston has just gotten notice from the federal, I want to say this out, Federal Aviation Administration, because I always just say FAA, and you know. Anyway, uh, that enables uh, Ellington Airport to be used as a launch site for reusable launch vehicles, or RLVs. And this is going to be the 10th commercial spaceport in the United States, which I found to be very interesting because I could only name about three. And so I had to go online and try and find what the other nine were. Right. And I you could only find to, you got eight. Up to eight. Yeah. So there's, a, there's another commercial spaceport in America that I am very, very unaware of. Uh, it's the Higginbotham spaceport. Uh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> That's what you've been doing spaceport in your off time. tomorrow. Now I understand. <laughs> uh, this, so this spaceport is going to be used for launching microsatellites, astronaut training, zero gravity experimentation, and spacecraft manufacturing. Manufacturing uh, the infrastructure, of course, for support, support facilities to uh, be able to support reusable launch vehicles, but of course, only those with horizontal launches, which I found to be very interesting. Uh, as you can see, they so are horizontal horizontal launch, horizontal landing. Correct. HTL HTHV. HTHV. Yes. No. Uh, you can horizontal see horizontal the... takeoff. Hor HTHL. There you go. Yes. Horizontal takeoff, horizontal landing. Yeah. No Vs. No Vs. That would be vertical. <laughs> horizontal takeoff, horizontal <laughs> vertical. That didn't make any sense. <laughs> oh, anyway, it looks, I mean, that's an artist rendition that you mm -hmm. saw there. So who knows what it'll actually end up looking like uh, in the end. But that, that's really, that's exciting. And they're really excited about it. And more spaceports. It just goes to, show, well, I think we have more spaceports than we have available space planes. But it goes to show an excitement for it and a ability to fly it. And once those space planes do start to fly, um, they'll be able to do more than just tourists in space. You can actually use them as a you know, way to get from point A to point B. I think that'll be exciting. All right, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to be talking to the co-founders of Space VR, putting virtual reality, reality in space. Stay with us. We'll be right back. And welcome back to the show. Now, before we start talking space VR, I did want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow who've helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are the people who've contributed at least $5 to this specific episode. If you'd like to add, add to that and help crowdfund the show, you can do that by heading over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. All right, I'd like to uh, welcome both Ryan Holmes and... Uh, Isaac De Saza. I hopefully I said that correctly. Ryan is the CEO, co-founder, and chief designer of Space VR, and Isaac is the co-founder and CTO of Space VR. Gentlemen, welcome to tomorrow. Uh, tell us what are you planning to do with space and virtual reality? Initially, we're intending on putting a virtual reality camera on the International Space Station and uh, negotiating to get that camera. Uh, to be live so people can experience all things in space uh, through virtual reality live. So what is the virtual reality camera? That's not like a, you can't just go to Best Buy and go buy a virtual reality camera, although that would be awesome. Uh, so uh, what is your camera? How are you doing this? 
It did start at Best Buy, actually. Um, it, ah. It's a collection of, of modified um, GoPros that are hacked together um, with a hardware genlock so that they can all start recording at the same time. So you've got a bunch of, actually, I think we have a picture of one of your prototype units uh, sitting there. Dada, if you've got that picture, that would be awesome. Uh, maybe not. Uh, uh, so I think we've got the, uh, uh, you've got them like in a circle, uh, right? And then they, they, they kind of just look in different directions and then you trigger them. Now, here you go. Here's, here's the shot of that. Uh, that's yeah. not what you're actually sending up to space though, right? I mean, it's going to be a little. Not at all. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's generally like that, right? It's a bunch of GoPros. You're sending it up to space. And then what? And then, well, that's well, pretty hard to get that. <laughs> yeah, well, the details can get a little tedious, but uh, the basics of it is that this is, in fact, much more than just a camera. It's in the, it's a, our first spacecraft we're putting out there. And so the camera will capture the footage. It'll do some onboard stitching, and then it'll pass the images back down to us. And then on Earth, we'll be able to have a perspective from space in virtual reality. And once we do that from the ISS, the plan is to take it everywhere else. So you're going to put this on the cupola in the International Space Station, is that correct? Are you going to, where, where is it going to go in the ISS? So right now the tentative plan is that it will be, um, it will have a storage place and that uh, it will be taken out and used repeatedly and then put back in the storage place. So, but it's, it's, I mean, you're not going to want to do VR of the storage space, right? So what, what yeah, you, you take it out and you just move it around the space station? Yeah, and it's then, like any other camera. And we're definitely hoping to capture lots of footage from the uh, from the cupola. Hmm. And then what's the so what's the business plan here? How do, how does this work, right? So sticking a camera up on the International Space Station is neat and cool, but how do you actually make money around this idea? Yeah, um, we would we would uh, we're looking for something similar to what you do, just a subscription based model with um, people that are really passionate about space. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps uh, we're going consumer and enterprise, so. Um, get contract with schools and such so kids can experience all this content being developed on a monthly basis. And what happens after the space station, right? So you go up to the space station, you've got this VR camera, you move it around, you get these cool VR views, then what? Uh, are, is it really only for station? Can you put it in other places? Can you put it on, say, rovers that go on Mars? Can you put it on the GLXP rovers that are going to the moon? Can you, can you do any of that cool stuff? For sure. Actually, so our, our plan is to really go everywhere with this. And uh, our cameras are sort of specifically designed to survive all of those extreme conditions, you know, outer space, you know, surface of Mars, uh, the radiation, the heat, all of that stuff. Um, so we're starting off on the ISS, and it would be sort of our, where we get our wings. And then from there, we're, we're hoping to go everywhere. Uh, we've also been reaching out to teams for the Google Earth X Prize, uh, see if they'd be interested in having our cameras aboard their rovers too. Uh, essentially, if something cool happens in space, anywhere in our solar system, we want to have a space VR camera there to capture it for everyone. So, uh, Tewicket has asked, uh, will this be pre-recorded only, or are you going to have live views from space? So, initially, it will be pre-recorded while we work on the live pipeline. Uh, live is not a trivial matter, but it's something that we're very confident we can do. Uh, we also had another question from the community. This is from Patrick. This was uh, e uh, Twitter tweeted. Uh, in, I'm not sure how to make that go, uh, tweeted in earlier, uh, asks, what type of tasks do you hope can be accomplished with VR gear in space? For example, a control of a robotic arm on station, you know, what would you be able to do with this? Um, you can really do anything you can imagine. Like one of the big things that we've been uh, looking at in terms of uh, real applications for space VR is uh, teleoperation. So in space, the problem is, you know, you want to have your camera facing everywhere, but every time you move the camera, there's, like, forces associated with that. And so a VR camera is really special because it uh, doesn't require the operator to control a camera either. There's no active control system. Uh, and so there's all kinds of neat things that you can do, um, as well as have an experience for the operator that's more organic, so he feels like he's actually there. Uh, Space Mike actually asked a really great question, which is, how are regular people going to use the VR? So we, you've got this VR camera up in space. You've got these great views coming out of the cupola, these amazing 360-degree views. Now, how, as I, as a mere mortal, do I get to be able to see that? Yeah, so um, the, the very baseline of being able to participate is buying uh, a $10 uh, cardboard to use with your cell phone. Do, is that the Google uh, the Google plan, or is that is that something custom There's, to you guys? Google was 
first one, but there's there's a there's numerous different yeah. ones like that. The but, great thing about the market right now is that whatever head, whatever phone you have or whatever headset you're interested in, uh, there is something out there to meet your needs. So you, you'll have. You, there will be VR, by the time you're ready to do this, there'll be VR that uh, mere mortals can use. And you'll have a subscription plan of sorts where you can go in and say, hey, yeah, I want access to all of the ISS footage for a month or, you know, whatever you may have. And then I can go download that and view it in whatever VR format that I may need, like Oculus, um, the, the Google Cardboard. It has a name. I don't remember what the project name is. I think Microsoft has something like ho their HoloLens stuff. That's the general plan? Exactly. And there's a Kickstarter campaign you're working on as well. Can you give me some details? I think it's like coming out in just under 50 days. What's, uh, what's the plan with Kickstarter? So the plan with Kickstarter is we're going for a minimum of 500K, and that's just to do the very baseline MVP of what we can do. And then um, we're going to add stretch goals so that we can keep expanding from there. Um, one, um, if you want to talk about those stretch goals. Sure. Um, so we're starting off with uh, just the camera inside the cupola, uh, but some of the stretch goals we want to do include spacewalks. Uh, so getting our camera outside the cupola, uh, getting bigger experiences to tag along with astronauts, um, and then eventually building up into even cooler things like our own free flying camera in space and even space diving. So that's a re entry video from outer space into the atmosphere in virtual reality. So we're kind of hoping to have some of those cool experiences out there. Uh, and just open that up for, for people to consume. What happens if you don't make, you said it's a half million dollars, $500,000. What happens if you don't make that uh, and the Kickstarter doesn't get funded? Are you still able to proceed? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. We can just get a standard investment, but yeah. That's right. So uh, then why do you need the Kickstarter? So if you're able to proceed it's without really the Kickstarter, what's the Kickstarter add on top of everything else? Yeah, it, it's building a community of people who really like what you're doing and getting your, your name out there and um, really plugging into the people that are passionate about what you're doing. So there are a couple questions in the chat room. I'm going to consolidate them all into one, which is how does this differ from something, say, like the high-definition Earth viewing experiment that they've already got up on the space station? Or there's even a camera that sits on one of the... Um, um, uh, dish network satellites that actually gets the entire earth what's different about that than or you know taking that and just dropping it into a VR helmet is to opposed to what you're doing well the uh, i think the big difference for this is that that footage was never meant to be captured or consumed from the perspective of a person um, our camera first of all does 360 um, and i think an even finer point is that this camera is meant to replicate what it would be like if you were in space so this is not a camera of sending down footage that's been manipulated. This camera's been specially calibrated for about the size of a human head to mm -hmm. capture the footage from the perspective of the person. And so this camera will have you feeling like you are in space, not you are watching space. Uh, yeah, it's the difference of watching a YouTube video and being there. How, how real is this project at this point, right? So we saw that you have that uh, the kind of the development hardware. How close are you to actually being able to fly that and put that up on station? We're um, working really closely with uh, Nanorax. Uh, Jeffrey Member, the CEO, is on our advisory board, and he has given uh, us approval that we have everything necessary to, to do this now. And in terms of our technical development, our camera is on schedule for being completed uh, for delivery by mid-August to late August. So our hardware is also coming along nicely. And uh, one question has kind of come up a couple times. Uh, Citizen09 has asked it recently. Is What about the privacy of astronauts? So you've got that 360-degree view. You're in space. It's very easy to get uh, what would be considered like an upskirt shot. How, how do you protect against that? Um, we, we just have to do what we have to do. Yeah. Uh, in 360, editing out some of the astronaut shots is actually quite easy. So a, a small delay will enable us to, if they come in shot, we can edit them out. So we respect the astronauts' privacy immensely. It is their workplace and their place where they live. Um, and so without their consent, they will not be shown on camera. That works for your on-demand content. Have you considered what you're going to do for live as well? Uh, well, live will always have a, a built-in um, delay. It's um, just a necessity out of it. Um, but I think the bigger part of it is that we can do um, sort of like notices with the astronaut. If the astronaut is to come by, we can even within a few seconds, uh, switch over the camera so that the astronaut doesn't show up in the VR shop. Uh, where can people go for more information? I know you've got your Kickstarter campaign coming up. Uh, you've got uh, some social media accounts. Where can people go for more information on what you guys are doing if they're interested in your project? 
yeah, you can uh, sign up on spaceVR.cl or you can follow us on Twitter. And we're pretty active on that and uh, Facebook as well. Well, good luck. I think it's going to be really awesome. Uh, I'm excited to see some virtual reality space shots from the International Space Station. I'm actually, I think, even more excited to see something if you team up with some of the Google Lunar X Prize teams. I'd love to see uh, the rovers with a VR, like 360 degree camera, uh, just roaming so you can look anywhere you want on the moon or on Mars or wherever it may be. I'm, I'm excited to see what you guys are able to do. Thanks, Ben. We are too. All right, awesome. Thank Thanks, you guys man. for taking time out of your Saturday. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, comments from our last week's show. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. And welcome back to tomorrow. Now, before we get started with viewer comments from our last show, I'd like to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are the people who've contributed at least two dollars and fifty cents or more to this specific episode. Now, at this level, they're also going to get an access, uh, early access to After Dark as soon as it's made available, uh, and you get a couple of the cool things like your name in the show and obviously uh, all that other fun jazz. But wait, there's more. We also have our Patreon subscribers. These are people who've contributed one penny to one dollar, I'm sorry, two dollars and 49 cents. So as little as one penny gets your name in the show. And uh, like I said, we are a crowdfunded show, whatever you think the show is worth. So if you think these shows are worth nothing, then contribute nothing. But if you think they're only worth a penny per show, then you know what? We would be proud to put your name in the show, saying that you think that this show is worth something. Um, if you think it's worth a dollar, five dollars per episode, whatever you think it's worth, uh, please consider contributing over at patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. Every single penny does help. Every penny goes into the show. You can see the cool new set, or at least a rev rev revved set and stuff like that. All right, let's go ahead and get started with comments from our last week's show. First up is from Hal Halver? Halvor. You're the one who put the name in this I do, I don't know. I don't know what it is, though. All right. Well, this one comes from YouTube. How's that for an answer? <laughs> uh, it's been a couple of months since last time I watched TMRO. What's at the studio? Looks like you've moved into the kitchen, sitting down at a breakfast table. Uh, not this week. <laughs> uh, fixed up the set, yeah. <laughs> so what happened, for those of you who weren't paying attention, we this is a home studio. It literally takes over part of our home. And uh, we do actually eventually want to build a studio studio space, and we had an opportunity to do that. We could either cr do space pods, and we do, we do pay our space pod correspondents, so we could do our space pods and get more content out there, or we could build a studio and improve the weekly shows. I opted to do the space pods instead of the studio, and I actually think that was the right call, although it, it just destroys our funding for the show. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we cannot do the studio space because we chose to do additional content. I hope you guys have been enjoying that. Um, uh, so when we moved, because we moved fairly recently, mm -hmm. the entire control room and the set and everything had to move with us. And before we had these long, huge walls and we would just we'd move you know things away from the walls and that's what we would use. The new place does not work that way. We have giant windows everywhere, smaller, I mean, it's still large. It's nice for living. It's, it's, it's kind great of for living. for a studio. Uh, horrible for a studio <laughs> space. So uh, a huge thank you to uh, Tim, to Dutta, uh, to his wife Kat, I can say wife now, that's great, uh, and to, uh, to, for allowing me to steal you yesterday, all of Friday, and we rebuilt the entire set. Uh, so uh, it looks similar, but it is actually quite different. The foam doesn't fall off the wall anymore. There are no more seams. <laughs> we got the tables in place. We have cool plants. We'll talk about those in After Dark. So uh, yeah, we always are working on improving the, improving the show, improving the set, improving all aspects of it, the, the content, the entertainability of it, um, all of it. And, One uh, day we'll be replaced too, I promise. We're probably not that far in the distant <laughs> future too. <laughs> we do need better content. 
All right, all right, moving <laughs> along, moving along. This one also comes from YouTube from Nico's Mind. Uh, Nico's Mind. Yeah. Uh, do we need governments for research? Short answer is no. For one, government contributions to research is still extremely my, is it still an extreme minority, sorry. Considering how that compounds over the years, the government has done next to nothing. Um, yeah, I mean, there's also an Amazon link in there that was really hard for you to read <laughs> and type out. You're welcome, Internet. Um, <laughs> Can we make it clickable? No, On that's the, the worst part. I can't know. Yeah, YouTube Curses. doesn't let you do that. It's really silly. Oh, well. Um, I have not read that book, but that is an interesting idea that... Um, and actually... Um, Another one was the Bill Gates Foundation has done more for its uh, some research, uh, mm -hmm. I don't remember what it is, than like all of the governments combined. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think it can be done in privatized uh, space or private areas, but, you know, you do still have to make money there. Mm -hmm. So uh, I thought it was an interesting concept and an inter interesting comment, so we added it in the show. All right, next up. Comes from Will B, also from YouTube. Will B. Yeah, Will B. That's what I said. Will B. All right. Goodness. Will. <sighs> We're better together. Story of the human race right there, followed by our complete inability to actually unite. Weird paradox, ain't it? We do better in large groups, but refuse to make the largest ones we can. Sociology is so complicated and weird. It is. All of that was true. We are, in fact, better together. When we as a species decide to unite behind something, we do amazing things. But getting us as a species to actually unite behind something... Oh, next to <laughs> impossible, next to impossible. Oh. Everyone has their vision of how it should be. And you know, that's both part of what makes us so amazing as a species mm -hmm. and, and holds us back. So yeah, again, another very insightful and good comment that I wanted to bring up on the show. All right, next up. I, is this Neosis? Wait. Neosis. 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 Oh, I like this one because I got, thank, first off, thank you. I got a, T, a TLDR, too long didn't read. Yes. Like single paragraph up top. Yes. That made it really easy for us to insert it into the show. Yes. If you're interested in this comment, head on over to YouTube, search for the username on our last episode, 8.19, and there's actually a lot more content that goes with it. But this was a great way to summarize it. I, I think this was a, because I was whining about, you know, blah, 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 YouTube, put it in 140 characters. You will get to speak in a second. 140 characters. This was a great alternative to that. So, all right, there you go. I also wanted to say, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Hence the long breath. You're welcome. Neosis from YouTube says, too long, didn't read. Neil deGrasse Tyson, slightly stretching the truth to have a bigger impact, hoping to get people excited for NASA will increase the budget. That, in turn, will speed up the whole Mars endeavor. Yeah, you know, and, uh, and the longer comment kind of goes into his goal isn't necessarily to put down private space, but to build up NASA and hopefully get more funding for that. You know, he kind of started that half penny on a dollar thing and right. the whole penny for NASA thing mm -hmm. kind of spun out of that. Um, so, yeah, that's not necessarily wrong, but... Um, I don't feel like you need to put down one in order to lift up the other. You could be, you could be correct in that. All ships know. rise with the tide. Yeah, exactly. All ships rise with. Yeah, there you go. All right. Next ah, one. I shut you up with your own words. That was awesome. Oh. Jax Vidstar from YouTube says. You keep on blaming Congress this and Congress that, but what about that certain government branch that dictates NASA go collect an asteroid and not send humans to Mars? That would be the executive office uh, talking about the uh, current administration. The thing is, it's not that simple. It's not that black and white. What happened was um, they didn't want to do any of that. Right. Uh, they were kind of forced to by Congress because Congress, they, we canceled uh, Constellation because it was a behemoth of a thing. Reinventing the wheel like over and over and over again was what Constellation was doing and not getting the funding necessary to run it. So um, canceled that and the goal was to kind of regroup and figure out something out but Congress was like, no, 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 you need to have this big vision for something. And so like, fine, asteroid return mission. It, was all, it has always basically been this throwaway thing. And um, I, again, am also oversimplifying that greatly uh, but I think everyone's to blame, mm -hmm. right? It's not just Congress, not just the executive branch. It's, it's, it's everyone, right? They're, they're, we're in this situation because a lot of bad decisions were made, and hopefully we can stop making those bad decisions and start making some good ones. So there you go. All right. All right, next up. Stephen Thompson. That one's easy. From YouTube. <laughs> Says the American. Uh, there are more ways than one to expand the frontier. It's unlikely a private company will launch a mission to Pluto anytime soon, and it's unlikely that NASA will 
uh, ever open an orbital hotel? You know, actually, I thought that was extremely insightful. And, um, it was a great way of wording that, too. It was a great way of wording that. We are trying to open the frontier here. We're trying to get humanity out there. And it doesn't have to just be private space, and it doesn't have to just be NASA. And frankly, right. all of these entities are in their own way going to open up the frontier. And there is nothing wrong with them doing their own thing. Mm -hmm. And NASA going to Mars, who doesn't matter who goes to Mars, for someone going to Mars, that's opening the frontier. Frank Frankly, a Bigelow Hotel mm -hmm. also opening the frontier. And mm -hmm. I'm super, I totally want to stay at the Bigelow Hotel. Dear Robert Bigelow, <laughs> <clears throat> it is our 15th wedding anniversary next year. <laughs> I would love for you to have as a wedding anniversary destination a Bigelow Hotel. You have almost exactly a year, almost, not quite, almost exactly a year from right now to get one of your Bigelow, like 51 weeks. Big, Bigelow modules flying and then um, ideally turn it into a hotel, which I think you said you didn't really want to do. But whatever, dear Robert Bigelow, please <laughs> allow us to have a Bigelow Hotel. I think that would be awesome. I would love to stay out in space. It has to have a window, though. Wouldn't it suck if it didn't have any windows? <laughs> it would be hilarious <laughs> when you think about it. You'd be like, I'm in space, but uh, no overview. Uh, the pictures would be crap. <laughs> just look like us jumping. Yeah, well, although we should I just think, do that anyway. I think I think he's really waiting on the launch providers. He needs a large. He needs like a Falcon Heavy or a space launch system or a really big like thing to launch his his Stuff. modules, his bigger modules. Yeah. All right, that's our show for this week. I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching. For those of you watching live, After Dark is up next. If you're a Patreon Plus subscriber, you'll have access to that in your Patreon feed as soon as it's made available. For everyone else, it'll be available in weeks. So, it's getting worse and worse. It used to be four weeks, now I think we're up to like eight weeks. Whatever. We'll get there someday. I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching, and we'll see you next week.